Hello, my name is Kevin Patty. I'm a park ranger with the National Park Service, and today I'm here at Glen Echo Park to talk about the Denzel Carousel, which will celebrate its centennial in 2021. Glen Echo Park um, was Washington's premier amusement park for 70 years. Uh, before that, it was a Chautauqua assembly where people came in the summertime to go to lectures and concerts and, and book discussions. And since the amusement park closed in 1968, Glen Echo Park has been a center for creativity and for the arts and culture again. Today, the Glen Echo Park Partnership for Arts and Culture and Montgomery County helped to manage the park as a center for the arts. There are over a thousand classes offered, many festivals and social dances throughout the year. Today, we're gonna to see the carousel and learn about its fascinating story. I'm standing here uh, at the entrance to the old amusement park with the amusement park sign behind me and you can see the carousel down the hill. In 1911, the uh, trolley company hired uh, Leonard Schloss to manage the amusement park. Mr. Schloss had experienced uh, running amusement parks and his job was to make Glen Echo Amusement Park into the premier Washington amusement park. And as Leonard Schloss deserves credit for for buying the Denzel Carousel and uh, bringing it here in 1921. The park superintendent um, built, led the building of the building that the carousel is in, and that was built on site here and in the yellow barn. Streetcar tracks are right here in front of the amusement park sign. People got to Glen Echo Amusement Park on the streetcar or trolley. Um, Glen Echo Amusement Park was a trolley park. It was owned and operated by the streetcar company. It was built as a destination for trolley riders. You rode the trolley to work during the week, but on weekends and on, at night, you could ride the trolley to the amusement park and dance in the ballroom and ride the roller coaster and the, and the carousel. To ride the streetcar in Washington, D.C. in the 40s, you had to buy a trolley pass. And these are, these are passes from 1942. They were good for one week, for, for seven days. And this one is for the 20th week of the year. This one's for the 13th week of the year. And they both have images of the amusement park. And they were telling trolley riders uh, that they could come out to Glen Echo Amusement Park and enjoy the fun that was to be had. Um, you could, if you, if you acquired this, this pass, you could go wherever you wanted to in the city for seven days. On Friday nights, um, kids would, would stand outside of office buildings in downtown D.C. hoping that those guys that came out of work on Friday, and once they got on the streetcar, they were done with that pass. So if a kid could get the pass from, from that man, he could have the pass to use over the weekend and go to Glen Echo Amusement Park to have a lot of fun. This carousel, this William Denzel carousel from 1921, has three rings of animals. It has an outer ring. Um, these are standing animals. They don't go up and down. And they're larger than the inner two rings of animals. This carousel goes in a counterclockwise direction. direction. The, the, the adults, generally adults, ride the outer ring of animals. Uh, and they tried to gra grab the brass ring and they use their right hand. The, the ring machine holds um, a series of steel rings, but one brass ring. And if the rider uh, is lucky enough to get the brass ring, they get a free ride or another prize. And this, this, uh, this custom is, is uh, popular and uh, is referred to in popular songs. And grabbing the brass ring is like um, going for it, grabbing the grabbing the prize. These uh, standers, um, standing animals, are next to um, sm smaller jumping animals that are for children, and they go up and down as the carousel goes round and round. All of these animals have a romance side, a side that faces the audience, a side that um, appeals to the audience, that make them want to come in and ride, and it's more highly decorated and more colorful and more beautifully carved. Now I'd like to tell you about the Denzel company that built this carousel. Gustav Denzel uh, started the Denzel Carousel Company in America. He immigrated from Germany. His father, Michael Denzel, 
um, was a woodworker in Germany and built carousels and then traveled around the German countryside in the summertime uh, with, with these small carousels, these, these uh, portable carousels. And so Gustav grew up doing this, grew up learning how to do woodworking, grew up working with his father, grew up uh, operating carousels and having fun sharing carousels. And so as a very young man, he brought that idea to America and he started a cabinet making shop in Philadelphia and built a small carousel. And then by 1870, he had a larger uh, factory in the Germantown section of Philadelphia and uh, started building larger carousels and would go on to have uh, 30 employees and they would build two or three carousels a year. The factory had, had three floors. The, the, the bottom floor uh, had machine tools. The second floor had a carving room with, with several carvers working on carving these animals. And then the third floor was the painting department where painters painted all these beautiful animals. Gustav Denzel was 24 years old when he moved into that larger factory in 1870. Um, Gustav was a, a carver, but as I've mentioned, there were other carvers that worked with, with him. And uh, Daniel Muller is one of the most well-known and, and one of the most talented carvers. Daniel Muller uh, worked on this carousel, on many of these animals. Daniel Muller's father had been an employee of, of the Denzel Company, had been a carver. He died at a, at a young age. And so Daniel and his brother Alfred were really taken in by Gustav Denzel. And um, he, Gustav was like a father to them. And so um, uh, Daniel Muller studied formally at the uh, Pennsylvania School of the Fine Arts and um, became a master carver. Uh, Daniel Muller and his brother left the Denzel Company and they started a Muller Brothers uh, carousel company. Um, after several years, that company um, closed up shop and uh, Daniel Mother came back to work on, on uh, the Denzel Company again and, and, and on this carousel. A second carver I'd like to tell you about um, is, is also an immigrant. Uh, this carousel was really built by, by immigrants and by the sons of immigrants. Um, Salvatore Cernolario. His, his uh, nickname was Cerny, C-E-R-N-Y. Um, Salvatore uh, came from Italy in um, 1902, and he was 23 years old. And he found a job as a wood carver um, for, for a man who was building a carousel for his own. Uh, he was a wealthy man and had a private uh, property. And uh, Salvatore uh, worked on that project and when it was done, he was out of a job, and needed another job. And so he asked around uh, if there were any other places in Philadelphia that built carousels. And he was told about the Denzel Carousel Company. And so Salvatore uh, went to the company and, and Gustav Denzel was in front of uh, the factory. Salvatore um, knew three words of English at the time. He knew me, he knew woodcarver, and he knew job. And so he said these words to Gustav Denzel, and um, he couldn't understand what Gustav was saying. Gustav knew German uh, and very little English. And, uh, and of course, Salvatore didn't know English. And so uh, he left thinking that he didn't have a job, that there wasn't a job for him. And so he, um, he uh, struggled after that and was, was running out of money and, and had not enough money to pay rent and was fearing that he would be uh, kicked out of his apartment. And so he went to church and he prayed that he would be able to find a job. And after he came out of church, it was a very hot day and he was thirsty. And he remembered that there was this artisan well near the Denzel factory that he had seen the previous week. And so he went over there uh, to get a drink of water. And there again, he saw Gustav Denzel was in front of the factory. And so he, he went again to him and he talked to him. He said the three words that he remembered, um, job and um, wood carver and uh, me. And Gustav Denzel this time took him into the factory where there was an Italian worker 
and that man was able to translate for them. And it turned out that Gustav had hired him the first time and that had wanted him to come the next day. And so now this is a great, a great thing that uh, Salvatore was able to start working for the uh, Denzel Carousel Company, worked for many years and did a lot of great carving. The Denzel Carousel Company made menagerie carousels, meaning carousels that were made up of many different animals, not just horses. And uh, here I'm standing next to the, the bunny. Salvatore Cernilario, uh, Cerny, um, brought the bunny into the carousel company's uh, repertoire, the bunny and the cat. And so this is an example. Um, we don't think that Cerny worked on this particular carousel, but he had brought this element into the carousel. The carousel is beautiful, as you can see. It's a, it's a visual delight. And the ride depends on music. And to provide that music, we have a Wurlitzer military band organ. This organ has many wooden pipes that play sax, there are saxophone pipes, clarinet pipes, and flute pipes. There's a snare drum and uh, a triangle and, and a cymbal. The organ plays like a player piano plays with paper rolls, with um, holes, the holes in the rolls tell the organ what to do. And it's a pneumatic instrument. Air, air uh, helps it to work, makes it work. The uh, Wurlitzer uh, company was started by a German immigrant, Franz Rudolf Wurlitzer. Um, he, he had a, a factory in, a, in New York State which uh, built this organ and it, uh, it still works today and, and delights uh, visitors. After the park manager Leonard Schloss purchased this carousel and built the building and installed the carousel, it, it thrived. It really was the centerpiece of the amusement park he had created. Um, and it, it uh, was a delight to so many people. Uh, during the war years, when Washington um, grew in population, so many people from other parts of the country came here to support the war effort. Glen Echo Amusement Park was really a, a great destination for people to get away from their cares and to uh, have fun and uh, enjoy themselves. The, uh, the amusement park continued to thrive um, through the 40s and 50s and uh, into the 60s. But the tragedy of, of the story of Glen Echo Amusement Park is that that, that fun, that, that ability to get away from things um, and to enjoy themselves wasn't, wasn't available to everyone. This was a segregated amusement park for most of its history. In 1960, um, that began to change. A, a group of, of Howard University students um, did a series of sit-ins at drug stores in Arlington, Virginia, to, um, to speak out against the policy of, of segregation on, in those drug stores. They were successful. They were able to change uh, the policy, to force the change. And, uh, and they, they decided to, to bring their efforts to Glen Echo Amusement Park. And on a Sunday, June 30, 1960, about a dozen protesters uh, were given tickets to the carousel by some white patrons outside the park. And they came and uh, did a sit-in. And here I have a picture of Lawrence Henry, who is the lead protester, sitting on the bunny uh, uh, that day. Uh, the park uh, security guard um, was there to tell him that, that this was private property, that the park was segregated, and that he would have to leave. Um, he refused to leave. And he and his fellow protesters were arrested uh, that day. And after that, um, they came back and uh, began to picket at the top of the hill here where, where the park entrance was. And they were, were then um, joined uh, later by uh, people from the community of Bannockburn. Bannockburn across MacArthur Boulevard um, had many residents who, were, who had experience with protesting in the labor movement and were interested in collaborating with the Howard students. And so now their numbers grew and they, they developed schedules and, and created signs and, and, uh, and picket songs and uh, created this, this system of protesting that lasted the whole summer of 1960 and was ultimately successful in changing the policy of the amusement park 
the music park would be integrated for the rest of its operation uh, for seven years until the park closed in 1968. The Glen Echo Amusement Park closed in 1968 for three, three reasons. Uh, one reason was the, the tensions around uh, civil rights. This park had integrated, but there were still um, tensions that, that uh, had an impact on the, the amusement park. The trolleys leaving Washington, D.C. in the early 60s was a second uh, factor. This had been a trolley park. People got here uh, on the streetcar. Um, and now people had cars of their own and could go um, wherever they wanted on their Sundays and, and not just where the trolley took them. Um, people began to live in the suburbs and, and had televisions in their homes. And so uh, these changes impacted small amusement parks like this one. And the third uh, factor that led to the closing of the amusement park was property value. This, this amusement park had started out um, uh, far from the city, in, in a rural area, but by the 50s and 60s, this was uh, very much where people wanted to live. And so this, the value of this land uh, far outweighed the value of the amusement park. And the amusement park owners were getting uh, offers to build, um, offers to buy the land to build apartment buildings with a view of, of the Potomac River. There was an effort to uh, save this park from development. The Lyndon, President Lyndon Baines Johnson's ad administration uh, was interested in uh, protecting the Potomac River from development. And during that period, um, a, a land swap uh, was worked out where this park was acquired um, and, uh, and it was given to the National Park Service in 1970 to protect it from development. In the meantime, this carousel had been sold. When the amusement park closed in 1968, they sold rides to different amusement parks. This was sold to a man in Virginia who sold it to another man in California. And his plan was to, to move this carousel to California. A local resident, Nancy Long, who grew up in Glen Echo and uh, who would serve on the town council for 50 years, uh, starting at that time, um, she saw that this was about to happen, and she went to the man in California and worked out a deal with him that if she could raise $80,000 in, in a month, he, could, he would sell the carousel back to her. And this was 1970. And so her Save the Carousel committee that she led uh, was able to do that. They had a, a matching donor, and they raised the money, uh, the other part of the money, and uh, were able to buy, buy this carousel and then donated to the National Park Service in 1970. This was a working amusement park for 70 years and the carousel was, was brought here in 1921 and, and after a period of time it needed uh, to be maintained, it needed painting in it and so the carousel, the carousel was painted as were so many of the other buildings around us and uh, after after painting the carousel animals again and again, they changed. The original color scheme that the company put on in 1921 was lost by successive layers of paint over, over the decades. So when the National Park Service got here in the early 70s, they, they had to start thinking about um, restoring this carousel to the way it had looked uh, originally, which was a big task. And um, it was a 20-year effort from 1983 to 2003. The animals were, um, were two or three per winter were taken to a studio. The restorer, Rosa Regan, uh, worked to restore um, each animal and then bring them back in, in the fall and the spring. Uh, Ms. Regan and, and volunteers and uh, workers that worked with her I worked on parts of the carousel that couldn't be removed. And that project was funded by donations, largely. So in 2003, the carousel was, was fully restored. And now it's, it's maintained well by, by the Glen Echo Park Partnership for Arts and Culture, the National Park Service, and uh, Montgomery County. They all worked together to maintain this carousel and keep it operating for the visiting public.